just have a few moments to share something uh, with all of you that is near and dear to my heart. Um, I've I saw a couple of you in the four-year before service, but as Chess said, my name is Joe Wright, and I'm uh, currently an associate pastor of youth and discipleship just up the road at Fenton Church, the Nazarene. And uh, my wife, Maria, and I, we have a picture of our, our family here. We've been married nearly 10 years. Uh, we have four uh, lively, rambunctious kids. Uh, Abigail is seven, Elizabeth is five, Ian is two and a half, and Lydia uh, was born on Christmas Eve this past year. So um, it is not very quiet in our house, but it is good and it is exciting. Um, and I'm just thankful to be here and to be able to share with you about Pinckney Community Church this morning. As you guys are kind of in this little series on God's mission to us. And so I just want to begin with uh, a few verses from Isaiah that have spoken greatly to me in this journey of joining God in his mission to the Pinckney area. Uh, it comes from Isaiah chapter 43, verse, verses 18 and 19. And here, God is speaking through the prophet Isaiah to the Israelites who are in the, the midst of exile. They're, they're in the desert. We just sang about the desert song a few minutes ago. And, and they are there. And God speaks to them. He says, do not remember the former things or consider the things of old, but I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Do not remember the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. In the midst of exile, God promises a new thing developing in the midst of Israel. It's, it's this promise of redemption. It's, it's a promise of hope. I think Crystal just alluded to it, but in, in many ways for a lot of us, maybe we have felt a little bit like those exilic Israelites over the past year, but in the midst of the chaos and the uncertainty and the darkness, the voice of God is still calling out, still calls out to say, join me on mission. I am about to do something new. For our family, the something new is a, a call to plant a church. It's a calling that began over two years ago at Urbana Missions Conference, and, and during one of our worship sessions, I felt like I was giving me just this creative vision for what a church could look like. So I started jotting down notes and, and just kind of a, a different way to make disciples amongst the nations. And so coming out of that, I began to pray, and Maria and I began to pray, and we just started asking God what exactly this all meant for us. And through that season of discernment, we, we realized that God was calling us to plant a church. And I know that when I, when I realized that, I was asking myself some of the qu same questions that, that, that Pastor Chad mentioned last week as he walked through Psalm 8. Like, me, God, you, you want me to plant a church? Uh, clearly, you've got, you've got the wrong person because I didn't grow up spending a lot of time in church. I, I didn't go to, to Bible school, um, and if, if you haven't noticed, we've kind of been in a, in a pandemic here. You want us to plan a church right now? And just as, as I wrestled with those questions, and as we prayed, and, and we surveyed the district, um, we, were, we were drawn to um, what I've come to affectionately refer to as the holiness hole in our district. I think we got a, a picture of that there. There's kind of a map, um, and it kind of reaches like Pinckney, and Whitmore Lake, and Dexter, and Ann Arbor, and Ypsilanti. Um, but, but we don't have any Nazarene churches in this area. And, and there's few other Wesleyan holiness churches, whether they're Wesleyan churches or free Methodist churches. But there's a lot of unchurched and dechurched people that call that area home. And so we, we shared our vision with Drs. Gardner and Kitsko, and we received affirmation from, from the, the district office to begin a new work in this area. And, and throughout our journey, that, that text from Isaiah has been close to my heart. Don't, don't remember the, the ways of old. I'm doing a new thing. Do you perceive it? And it's caused me to ask, how can we get creative and innovative with what church looks and functions like, so that we can reach the unchurched people and those that have stepped out of church in recent years? How can we provide a space to wrestle with life's tough questions? How can we create a space where everybody knows that there's a seat at the table for them as we break bread and study the scriptures and walk through life together? And then kind of recently, the, the question has been, how can we plant more holiness churches in the holiness whole? 
So I'm excited to share with you that in February, we will officially be, be launching Pinckney Community Church the Nazarene. And at, at PCC, we're going to be guided by, by three phrases as we seek to equip found people to reach lost people. So we have a few slides here. The first one is open hearts. Open hearts to God and one another. Because we believe that, that God is constantly at work sanctifying us and refining our hearts as he shapes us to reflect his image to the world around us. And so it's essential for our hearts to remain open, that we can see and hear the work that God desires to do in and through us. Second phrase is open hands. To open hands to serve the communities and creation that surround us. Throughout the Gospels, we, we see that Jesus modeled that everything we have is a gift graciously given to us by God, to be used for his glory. And so we commit to, to giving generously of ourselves as we integrate our faith and our life and our vocation to partner with Jesus to bring about flourishing lives locally and globally. And the last phrase is open homes. Open homes to welcome everyone within our doors, at our tables, and into our lives. So we, we want our homes to be open as places of rest and refreshment and fun and fellowship, and we want to posture ourselves as hospitable neighbors to seek the welfare of those we share driveways with and cul-de-sacs with and life with. And so we're, we, we want to be creative in how and when we gather as a church. Meeting as both house churches and, and traditional big church on Sundays throughout the month. And in our months that we have a fifth Sunday, we're going to be out into the community. We won't be, we won't be meeting per se to, to have a worship service, but we will be out in the community serving our neighbors in love. And then one other thing that's not in any of the handouts I have with me today, but we want to be a church that's planting churches within that holiness hole as we look to Dexter and Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti in the years to come. And so I just want to say thank you again for the opportunity to share about Pinckney Community Church this morning. And if you have any questions or interested in learning more, we have a table set out in the foyer, and I'd love to talk with you after service. Um, as you pray and discern a, a few ways that you can partner with us in God's mission to the Pinckney area, or, or first um, through prayer, um, if you would... plant and for the Pinckney area. The second would be through connections. If you have contacts in the Pinckney area, maybe it's um, a family member, a co-worker, somebody you know that, that lives down there, would love to, to be able to connect with them. Uh, if you know anybody who is selling a house in the Pinckney area, um, that would be great to know. We're, we're starting to, to look for homes down there. Uh, my, my wife and mother-in-law and took the kids um, on a brave adventure down there for like four or five hours yesterday just driving around looking at the, the houses we have uh, saved on Zillow. But if you know anybody who, who's looking to move, that would uh, be great as well. And then lastly, uh, just the, the gift of giving. Um, our, our goal is to develop a base of monthly supporters for the first 24 months of Pinckney Community Church starting this October to, to help us offset salaries so that we can focus on mission. And so if you'd like to, to partner with us monthly uh, through monthly giving and through a special gift, um, you can stop by the table after service of some pledge cards that you could fill out. And so I just want to say thank you again um, for, for allowing me to stop by this morning and share with you um, the, the, the vision, the, the mission of Pinckney Community Church. Uh, God is at work doing something new as he calls us on mission, whether it's here in Howell or down the road in Pinckney. And the question for us is how can we join him in what he is already at work doing? Thank you, and I guess I'll hand it back over to Pastor Chad. Appreciate it. If you could stick around, I'd like to pray for Joe, and uh, if uh, you'd like to give... Uh, he's got. He's going to be set up in the back here. Make sure to uh, see him. Whether or not you want to give, make sure to see him. But uh, if you'd like to give online, we have a uh, space available to give to Pinkney, uh, the Pinkney uh, Fresh Expression that uh, Pastor Joe is going to be setting up. And uh, if you'd like to just give uh, to our 
through our giving boxes in the back. Just write Pinckney on there. We'll make sure it gets right to Joe. But I'd like to pray for Joe before he steps down. Lord, we are uh, so excited that uh, in the midst of coronavirus and uh, whatever plans the enemy might have had to divide and scatter the church, Lord, that uh, in the midst of coronavirus, there's new churches starting and there's new churches planting. And uh, I just pray that as Joe, uh, Pastor Joe and, and his team begins this work, Lord, it would just strike uh, into the, the fortresses and the strongholds of the enemy in that area, Lord, and that your message would just dominate and and send the enemy running away. And whatever plans he had for the coronavirus, in the name of Jesus, we pray against those plans. And we pray for your plans to overcome, and the church would be even stronger coming out of it than when we went, when we went in. And Lord, I pray for anyone here who might have uh, felt that tug on their heart, Lord, to join in, whether through giving or maybe even joining, Lord, uh, that we would be strong, step out on faith, and follow that journey. I want to pastor. I, I, I want to pastor and help with Pastor Joe. I want to partner with him and step out on faith. And Lord, uh, I pray we would have the strength to follow through on that. And anyone that would have that feeling on their heart, Lord, they have this church's blessing to go with and, uh, and come alongside. And, but we ask for your uh, success for this mission, Lord. And it would be all about you and only pointing people to you and uh, for a uh, and to be a discipleship through you and for your name and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate it. Yes, if you would like to go with Joe, not that I don't like you here, but you have my blessing. Be praying about that. I'm not trying to empty the church out. I just know that uh, God calls us places. He doesn't call us to sit around all the time. I sound like I'm kicking you guys out, but... Uh, if you're following God, you know, that God's going to be stirring on your heart to do things. Uh, the, first and, uh, the first and oldest and strongest temptation that humanity has ever faced, and really it boils down to really the only temptation, I think, I was thinking about this week, that we face is this temptation of just, ah, uh, who cares at the end of the day? That's no big deal. Or as Satan put it, uh, to the very first humans, did God really say this? Is it really that big a deal? Is it really something you need to worry about? Our temptations that we face are the exact temptations that every single human being has ever faced and has ever faced since the dawn of man. Satan doesn't have many tricks up his sleeve, but he's, he's really good at that one <laughs> big one, is getting us to think, uh, you know what, that's maybe no big deal. Did God really say that? Do you think he really cares about, I wonder why you're making such a big deal about this. The basic idea that Satan has always been trying to push on us is, who really cares? That's what he loves to say. Who cares? Sin, that's not that big a deal. You really think sin? Come on. Sin is a thing. You think God cares about sin? What is Satan's goal in this? Why would he expend all his energy focusing on this one big temptation that every single one of us face uh, and have always been facing? His goal is he wants to, apparently, erase any difference between the people of God and the world. He wants to erase any difference. So there's no difference between the people of God. We may think, well, that's, I don't see what the big deal about that is. I don't see why that's so important to him. But apparently, Satan knows it's very important. It's very, this, this distinguishing uh, mark of God pulling us out and setting us apart from the world and, uh, and saving us and rescuing us and uh, giving us his Holy Spirit and that those distinctive features about what God has called us to, Satan wants to erase all those. And where we might not think it's that important, Satan apparently thinks it's very important. He apparently thinks, if I can erase those boundaries, I've won this thing. And that's what he continues to try to do. Every pressure we face, every temptation we have fought with and wrestled with has something to do with God calling us to live differently than how we've been living or live differently from the world. And the world, the flesh, and the devil all saying, who cares about that stuff at the end of the day? It's no big deal. I'm not, did God really, you think God really cares about that? Every temptation boils down to that. Last week, I've been talking about uh, God's mission here, this uh, leading up to Easter and what God is doing in the world and how God is doing it. And last week, we found that uh, humanity has a special place in all God's creation. 
Guys, God created the, the heavens and the earth, and he created everything we read in Genesis. God, every time God created something, God says, and it was good, and it was good, it says, over and over again, and it was good. And then he creates humanity, and he looks down, and he says, and now it's very good. Where somehow, there's something about humanity that's very special in the plans of God. But then, as soon as, as, soon as you turn the page in the book of Genesis, you realize we got a big problem here. Because uh, even though humanity is, is crowned with kind of the height of creation in God's eyes, humanity, humanity immediately goes wrong. Each human has gone wrong. And instead of swearing allegiance to God and reigning under God, God wanted us to reign with him, be in charge with him. But instead of being in charge under God, we wanted to push God aside and we wanted to be in charge of ourselves and be in charge ourselves. And we take that authority on ourselves, which is, again, if you boil sin down to its ultimate thing, if you boil temptation down to its ultimate thing, the, the ultimate temptation is just, ah, who cares what God says? Do you think it's really that big deal? And if you boil sin down to its ultimate thing, it's really just us being in charge of ourselves and our own destiny instead of God. And through the scriptures, uh, we see this over and over again. It, uh, humanity keeps going wrong over and over again. And God uh, is rescuing them, and they go wrong again. God rescues them, and they go wrong again. And it seems like there's a big problem with this creation called humanity, this crowning achievement of God. There's something very, uh, very wrong with them. And what's God going to do about this whole thing? And you may wonder, as you're flipping through Genesis, as you're reading through Genesis and seeing all the ways that humans go wrong, and maybe thinking in your own life, all the ways that humans go wrong. And some people often think, why, why does God continue to even try to work with humans? <laughs> At some point, God would say, oh my word, we're done here. But God never seems to do that. And something major happens in Genesis chapter 11. So God, God has a, a special plan for humanity. We realize humanity goes wrong, but then God says, I'm not giving up on this. And what does he do? He calls out a single person, Abram. He'll later be known as Abraham. But he calls out Abram and his family, and he says, I want you to come out from the world, be separate from the world. I'm going to bring you over here. I'm going to separate you. I'm going to bless you, and then I'm going to send you into the world with a new mission, a new focus. It's going to be my mission. So humanity has gone wrong, but I'm not done with humanity. I want a special people for myself. So there's people all over the world, and it's gone wrong, but I'm going to set up a group of people, and I'm going to hammer it into their heads for thousands of years who I am and who they are, and I'm going to bless them, and I'm, they're going to fall away. I'm going to rescue them, and they're going to fall away, and I'm going to rescue them, and I'm going to keep blessing them with the purpose of going out into the world because I'm not done with this world. I still love this world. I still have plans for this world. And so God has this rescue operation he sets up. And... Uh, and this is how we find he's going to end up continuing to do things in the world. God is going to continue to do things in this world through this special group of people, this chosen people, the people of God. Now, at some point, uh, and right away, this goes wrong again, and Abraham falls into sin, and his family falls into sin, and fast forward a couple hundred years, and he's got a ton of descendants, as God promised him, but they're all in chains in Egypt through all sorts of terrible things. They've gotten themselves into some trouble. And again, God, through a person, Moses, rescues them out of Egypt. And he says the same thing. I'm going to pull you out from the world. I'm going to make you distinct from the world. I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to send you into the world with a new mission, which is the same thing he does for us. But I want to share these verses in Exodus. They're in your bulletins there, and they'll be on the screens. In Exodus 19, the Israelites have just been rescued from Egypt, and Moses is there on Mount Sinai. He's been talking with Yahweh, the Lord, and he's, uh, he's f finding out what the plans are for God's people. And this is the Lord speaking to Moses. He says in verse 9, or excuse me, verse 4, You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. 
And I'm going to continue. I know your bulletin ends there, but here's what Moses does when he gets this calling. It says, So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set them before, and set before them all the words of the Lord, excuse me, all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. The people all responded together, We will do everything the Lord has asked and said. And so Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. Here's this amazing picture. A bunch of nobodies, a bunch of slaves in the desert at the base of this mountain. And of all the peoples of the world, you think these are the least special people in the whole world. They're literally just a group of slaves. They don't have an army. They don't have anything. Uh, and God says, you're going to be my people. I, I, all the people of the world are mine. This is true. I, I own, I, everything is mine. But you are going to be a special people. This is going to be a special group. And you need to be different from the world. I'm going to set up a different set of laws. And, uh, and Moses comes and takes this down to the people and says, here's, what, here's the deal we got, guys. Here's the, here's the agreement God set up. We've got nothing, but apparently God is going to, he's chosen us to do this thing. Here's what he wants us to do. And the people say, yeah, we will do that. No problem at all. Tell God no problem. And Moses goes up and says, yeah, we'll, we're in. We're going to be your people. God says, okay, let's do this thing. God is uh, an amazing God. Although the world continues to fight against God and doesn't care about God. I mean, sometimes we're, we're guilty of this. I'm guilty of this at least. Looking out into the world and thinking, well, the world, you know, can get me out of here. This world is crazy. It's getting crazier every day. And uh, I find it almost hard sometimes to have compassion on the world when you see the world digging its own pits and then complaining about them being in a pit and going, well, what do you think is going to happen? You know, morons. Uh, but God apparently cares for the world. Doesn't care, just care for his people. He cares for the whole world. And he still has a plan for the whole world. And he still desperately loves the world as he desperately loves you and I being a part of this world. And God says, through this group of people, if we can go back to Moses, through this group of people, uh, the whole world is mine, but you're going to be special. A kingdom of priests, a holy nation, he says. Uh, I still have a plan for this world, and I'm going to continue the plan for the world through my people. And so he sets up all these laws in the Old Testament, and, uh, and you can read all these laws, hundreds of them. They don't follow them very well. They said they were going to, but they fall away time and time again. And again, God has to continue to rescue them. I'm, gonna con I'm not giving up. I'm not giving up, God says. Uh, and some of the laws people probably, like we do today, think, what's the big deal with that law? I don't understand that law. Do you think God really cares about that? Do you think God, what's, what's the meaning of this? And sometimes people like to point out strange laws in the Old Testament to make fun of, make fun of us and say, you really believe God? Look at this weird law in the Old Testament. And there are, I mean, yeah. You might even agree, yeah, well, tons of weird stuff in the Old Testament. <laughs> uh, we also remember that... Uh, Jesus came and, and saved us from being unable to fulfill the law, that we're not, we're not Christians because we follow the law. We're Christians because we have been rescued from the law and been called to live differently. But nevertheless, I think it's okay to say, yeah, there's a bunch of strange stuff in the Old Testament, uh, a bunch of laws, and, and sometimes even scholars say, I'm not, we're not even sure what the purpose of this law was. And I think even some of the laws, the, the whole purpose of them is just to be different from the world. Don't cut your hair like them. He said, well, what's the big deal about that? No, just don't do it. Don't wear these same clothes as them. Oh, come on. What do you think? Who cares? I like those clothes. No, just don't do it. Is there a reason for this, God? I want you to be different. How about that for a reason? I don't know if God would say that's how I talk to my kids. But maybe just the reason is just be different. If, if, it's, if something is special to you, you, you it, it, typically there's a, a reason it's special is because there is a difference. Remember, my kids had been bugging me for years as they were younger. They wanted a dog. And for years, I said, no, 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 no dogs. I don't want to deal with it. I don't want to deal with a dog. And then we'll take care of it. Yeah, sure. Okay, yeah, you'll take care of the dog. Yeah. No, we're not having a dog. And they would, every Christmas, they would ask. And every birthday, they would both ask, I want a dog. I want a dog. And finally, after, as the kids went to bed, they were, Christmas was coming around the corner, and they, all, they both wanted a dog. And I said to my wife, Kristen, I said, um, you know what, let's, let's get him a dog. I, I had a dog when I was a kid. It was a pain, but it was, you know, it's a good experience. I don't want to take that from him. I said, but here's the thing. I got two rules for this dog. If we're going to get a dog, I got two rules. One, it has to be ugly. 
It has to be an ugly dog. And two, it has to, like, something has to be wrong with it. It's got to have three legs, I said. Because I don't want, I want the kids to have, take pity on it. You know what I mean? I, I don't want, like, a nice pretty dog. I want, like, an ugly dog that you say, oh, something in you would want to take care of it. And I kind of thought, you know, good luck finding a dog like that, you know, but ugly dog that, with three legs. But Crystal, is, uh, Crystal, this is Crystal's special gift, and she says, okay, yeah, I'm on it. And two minutes later, Crystal says from the other room, she goes, I found one. I'm like, what in the world? I didn't even know you were looking yet. Uh, and sure enough, there's this dog at this rescue place that's about to be put down, but and it's, it's ugly as sin, and it's got three legs. And I, <laughs> okay, I guess we'll... Well, I'm going to get this dog for the kids. It's hardly even a dog. And, and sure enough, uh, this, you know, this kind of, uh, I call it three quarters of a dog. It's not a full dog, but it, uh, you take pity on it, you know? It, and it's this kind of this pathetic thing, and the kids want to take care of it because it's different, because it's special. And you'll see it, its back leg doesn't work and just kind of hangs there. And uh, she tries to get up on the couch, and she gets herself squat and tries to, spring up onto the couch and she can't make it so she bounces off the couch and the kids say oh let me take care of it and I say okay good it worked it worked they want to take care of this dog but there's something it, it's it's special because it's different it doesn't it's not like the rest it's not like the rest of the dogs it's not just one of these uh, one of these other things you you have compassion on you love it because of the differences my wife has one dimple just one single dimple she goes, I, I don't know why I'm sharing this one single dimple, and she just thinks, oh, that's weird. I, I hate that. Why didn't I get two or none? Why, why one? But I love that little dimple. I love it. It's special. It's unique. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> that's my dimple. I like it. I don't want it to go away. I don't want to erase it. Uh, uh, we are called to be different from the world, to be set apart. You say, well, for what reason? Who cares? Just for it, there's probably reasons, and if we do follow, we find out there are many great reasons to follow what God has for us, but we are called to be different. We are not supposed to be looking the same as the world. And this is what God's, the calling on God's people has always been. And right away, like I said, we see the same problem with God's people. They fall away time and time again, and we realize God had a special thing for humanity, and humanity went away. And then here comes the rescue operation for humanity. We see the, the, the ship of humanity is sinking, but God has this lifeboat here. And get on, the, the lifeboat's going to fix the thing. And uh, as we see this lifeboat go out, we realize, oh, something wrong with the lifeboat, too. The rescue operation has the same problem as the rest of the world. There's sin also in the rescue operation. There's sin also in the people of God. Yes, we are, they are distinct, and we are distinct, and we are called to be something different, but the problem is still here. The rescue operation for humanity needs a rescue operation. And finally, in the fullness of time, God sends his son to complete the mission. God says, what humanity could not do, I will do for humanity as a human. He's the one human, Jesus, the Son of God, who humanity has been waiting for, doing what none of us could do. He's the one uh, out of Israel, the one that Israel has been waiting for, doing what Israel couldn't do. He is the one every single one of us have been waiting for, being able to do what we could not do and what we were called to do. And he calls us to join in with him, and he invites us into new life in him, fulfilling what humanity was supposed to fulfill, doing what humanity was supposed to do, accomplishing what humanity was supposed to accomplish, rescuing what the rescue operation was supposed to rescue but was never able to. He is the one that the angels were looking forward to. He's the one who creation was groaning for and, and wanting. The, the, uh, creation itself knows, the animals know, the, the rocks and the hills and the trees know that there's a greater purpose, but it's not. Something has gone wrong, but here comes the one Jesus to set things right. And finally, Jesus wins the ultimate victory there on Good Friday. And through Easter, gives us new life and brings in new creation and starts bringing in that renewal process of new life and points the way toward the ultimate end where there will be the new heavens and the new earth. But everything is pointing to him and everything is fulfilled in him. Amen? As God's people in the Old Testament, uh, they looked forward to their Messiah when they realized the same problem of sin was in God's people as well as in the world. They needed to look forward to the Messiah. 
And here now in the, the, maybe you could say the New Testament age, in the New Testament and beyond, we look back to the Messiah, remembering the one who did come. But the point is it all points to him. And the other point I want to make today is we are all still being called out into the world. We are still God's people. God's chosen people. The amazing thing about Jesus is he blew the doors off the thing and he invited everybody in. If you would be forgiven, if you would believe in the name of Jesus, you are part of the rescue operation. You are part of what God wants to do in this world. And so he's going to do this. What's he going to do? The same thing. He's going to call you out. He's going to set you apart. He's going to bless you so you can go into the world and send the good news of Jesus into the world. But we, we realize we're still the people of God. Here's what Peter says in 1 Peter. This is the New Testament. This is after Jesus has died, resurrected, and ascended into heaven. He's talking about the, the, uh, the sin of the world. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, he says, But you, he's talking to the church, a ch- church of Gentiles, by the way, but you are not like that, the world. But you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. He could be talking to our church if we're in Christ. You are a chosen people. Listen to the language he uses. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. Where do you think Peter got these words from? He got them from the verses in Exodus we read. And what does he say? He says, now it's it's the church. It's God, Jesus blew the doors off this God's people and invited you all in. So you are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God For he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. We have that mission still. And just as God's people were called to be priests to the world, so we are called to be priests to the world as well. Now, I know many of us are uncomfortable with this talk of priests. We think the guys with the big hats and all that stuff. Or maybe even we think the Old Testament. Yeah, the priests, nobody, we don't have priests anymore, right? Well, um, kind of, but not really. We don't have a specific job that certain people are called to be priests. The amazing thing that Jesus did is when you uh, accepted Jesus, when you believed on him, you entered into this new life. And in this new life, your job, as all of our jobs are, are the job of a priests. We are all priests. So here's, here's the thing, and here's how this works. In the Old Testament, there was a category of people in Israel. There's the nation of Israel, and they had some people who were the priests. This one tribe was specifically for the priests. The Levites were the priests. And the job of the priests was to be the, 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 the people that were in between God and the rest of them. So here's Israel on one side, there's God over here, and the priests were in the middle, giving the things of God to them and bringing the things of them to up to God. The sacrifices, the praise, bringing all that to God, and the words of God and the laws and the, the, uh, and the mercy and love and forgiveness of God, bringing it to the people. Now, as, as God set all of Israel apart in Exodus, God said, if you look at all of Israel, the whole group, well, he said, he said if you look at the whole world, the whole world is mine, but you guys are going to be special. You guys are going to be to the world as priests, The whole nation is going to be as priests to the world. That is, you are going to be the people who are in between God and the world. That's your job, Israel, the kingdom of priests. That's what that means. And when Peter says this about the church, he says, guys, you're a part of this too. Here's what the job of the church is if you are in Christ. You are to be priests to the world. That's your job. We are the people who are in between God and the world. In Peter's mind, it's not the idea that, yeah, the guy up front is the priest and you're a parishioner. Peter's idea and God's idea and Moses' idea is in relationship to the world and God, we act as priests. All of us do. We are all priests to the world in that sense. That is our calling. That's why Jesus set us apart. We're set apart from the world so we can act in this position. Says, as Peter said, as a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of darkness into his light, and he called you to be priests. So even if you're uncomfortable with that word priest, uh, you've got to, in a sense, you understand that you are a priest to the world. That is your vocation. Now, what does a priest do? And I'll close with this. A priest, a priest has two jobs. Two, two main jobs, and keep in mind that this is your job as a priest to the world. You are a priest to your family, a priest to your workplace. When you're in your car, on social media, you understand you're different. You're set apart 
uh, as a person in between God and the world. And what does a priest do? Two things. One, and I mentioned it earlier, a priest brings the things of the world to God. And the second thing is a priest brings the things of God to the world. They act as that in-between. For, well, what does that mean? First, what does it mean to bring the things of the world to God? Really, it, it boils down to uh, prayer, bringing prayer to God. If we're not praying as people who are called apart in this amazing position, uh, we're missing out on at least half of what we're called to do as priests. Prayer, prayer. The, the, the hurt of the world, the anguish of the world, the, the pain of the world, one of our jobs is to bring that before the throne of our Lord. Pray for the world. And pray for mercy for the world. Uh, when we see the darkness of the world and, and how it sweeps people in and how people join in with the darkness and sweep others into the darkness, we need to pray, Lord, have mercy. Have mercy on not just them, but us. Have mercy on us, Lord. All the pain and the hurt that the world causes, we're supposed to be bringing that to God's throne. That's the job of the priest. Bring that before God. And not just the hurt and the pain, but the good stuff as well. The praise and the joy. We bring that to God as well. When we uh, feel uh, thankfulness and awe and, and wonder and, and just joy, our job as priests is to bring that, point it right to God where it comes from. That's where it's supposed to go. And if you're at a, a family gathering or uh, with your family and somebody asks you to pray, they must have recognized that you have the position of priest. They wouldn't put it that way. But feel, feel good about that. That's your, that's your job as a priest. That might seem funny, but that's one of the job descriptions of a priest. Let's bow our heads. Lord, thank you for this. Thank you for family. Thank you for the, the times of getting together. Thank you for food. Thank you for nourishing us. Thank you for the air in our lungs. Lord, all the gratitude that we feel, well, I want to point it right to you and take the gratitude of the people around you and point it right to God. That's one of the jobs of a priest. And what's the other part? Bringing the things of God into the world. Speaking and living God's truth and his love and his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness into the world. Speak it and live it. And, and ultimately, speak and live God's message into the world. That it's not about us. It's about what God did for us. Because God's res rescue operation is no different from the rest of, of the world. The rescue operation needed a rescue operation. We, of all people in the world, know that we need a Savior more than anybody else. So ultimately, our job is to point people to God. But bring the things of the world into God. It's a difficult... Uh, uh, did I say that right? Bring the things of God into the world. Uh, we have to live... One of the reasons we have to, again, live differently. Live separate from the world not live apart from the world, but do you, do you know what I mean? Carved out, living differently. And sometimes people will call you out for it, and maybe people will make fun of you for it. But that comes with the job of, of being a priest. And that's, uh, we have to be that in-between. Bringing the praises and the cries of the people to God and bringing the words and the truth and the love and the mercy of God to the world. Where else is the world going to get it? They're trying to do it themselves, and they just mess things up more and more and more. It has to come from the church. We have to uh, pick up that idea that we have a vocation. We have a mission. We have a, a ministry. I don't care who you are. If you are, you say, well, I'm a pretty lousy priest. Yeah, join the club. I mean, what in the world? Yeah, we all are. Of course you are. I mean, God forbid you think you weren't. Uh, like, we, we have a mission to the world, called out to be blessed, to go into the world and speak God's truth and love and forgiveness and mercy into the world. I was talking to a friend who was, uh, he was struggling at work because uh, somebody at work, a co-worker, had gotten themselves into trouble and uh, this kind of mob has formed at work and they want to, uh, I don't know, they want to have this guy's head or something. Head, heads will roll, he said. And, uh, and he said, I don't know what to do because obviously I disagree with what the guy did, but I also disagree with this mob mentality. And every day I go into work and people are asking me, What's, well, whose side are you on? Whose side are you on? And I said, tell them you're on the side of forgiveness. Part of the problem in this world is that we have these idea of sides. And part of the problem I think the church is so ineffective is we're picking the sides that the world has drawn up and, we're, and, and Christians are known apparently for arguing about the things that the, the same stuff that the world argues about. Instead, we're, we're, not suppo we're supposed to be somewhere different. I said, tell them you're on the side of forgiveness. He said, I don't think there's anybody on that side. I said, well, yeah, 
you're in good company at least. <laughs> uh, but that's where we need to be. Be careful about joining in with what the rest of the world is joining in with. And we, if that's all we're known for as Christians, eh, forget it then. And maybe that's why the church seems so ineffective is because when people think about Christians, they don't think, oh, they're the people who are concerned mostly with heavenly things. They, they think, oh, oh, yeah, they're those people that just argue and, and point fingers. And that's too bad. We used to have a, a phrase, a person is so heavenly minded, they're of no earthly good. You ever hear that phrase? A person is so heavenly minded, they're of no earthly good. They, they think so much about heaven, they don't do anything here on earth. You know, I don't think people say that phrase anymore. I mean, I've heard that phrase. I've heard that people maybe sometimes used to hear, say that phrase. I don't think people think it's true of Christians anymore. I think what they say about Christians now is they're so worldly minded, they're of no heavenly good. They're so mixed up in the world and, and, and fighting with one another and they look just like the world, they're of no heavenly good. I'd, like, I'd, I'd prefer the other one. I don't think I wouldn't like to have either, but I'd prefer the one where you're so heavenly minded, you're of no earthly good. I don't like either, but stop getting mixed up in the world. Stop looking so much like the world. And God asks, like he did to the Israelites, are you guys in? Are you in? Do you want to be my people or not? I give you the choice. God always gives people the choice. I set before you life and death, he says in the book of Deuteronomy. And then he says, choose life. Please, choose life. But I set before you life and death. And God says to the Israelites, as he says to each and every one of us here, are you in? Do you want to join in with what I'm doing? Do you want to be my people or not? And if you want to be my people, quit making your top priority about you and your kingdom. Quit making your top priority about the stuff, how amazing you are and the good that you can do. Quit making your top priority being like everybody around you. Quit making your top priority to blend in and hide out as good as you can from the rest of the world. Nobody's saved from a Christian who looks just like the world. They think, well, I guess I don't need to be saved from anything, right? Because they're just like me. Quit listening to the same lie that has been whispered to the people of God since day one. That lie of, oh, who cares? Eh, it's no big deal. Do you think God really said that? Be set apart for God's purposes. Be, and, so, and when you are set apart, God, here's how it always works in the scriptures. God sets people apart. He blesses them and blesses them and blesses them and sends them back into the world. But how can he do that if you're not, if we're never being set apart? Let's be set apart from the world today. Amen? I got more, but I got to stop. Lord, let's go to him in prayer. Lord, Jesus, you are a good, good God that you would look down us on, on us, even here in this church, that you would look at Center Point Church and say, I still want to work with them. I still want to partner with them. That you would look at Livingston County in Michigan and the United States, that you could look at the United States right now and say, I love them. God, help us to have that heart. Help us not join in with whatever the world has going on, Lord. Help us to focus on what you have for us and that you, what you have for the world. Help us to be on different sides. Whatever sides the world picks, Lord, help us to have the wisdom and the strength to be on a totally different side, to be on the side of Jesus, to be on the side of love and forgiveness and truth. God, I pray against the enemy in this place the enemy that would love nothing more than just to separate or to, than, than to erase the separation between us and the world. Lord, the, 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 I pray against the temptation to just blend in with the world. I pray, I pray against the, the work of the enemy in each of our lives where we've been bamboozled of thinking the, the, the wars of the world are our wars, Lord. I pray that your church would see different, see differently, see our vocation differently, and really grasp that mantle of, of priesthood to the world, Lord. What, a, what an amazing and humbling thing to be, to be those people in between you and the world. Help us to show the world who you are. Not only your love and your mercy and your truth, but show the world who you are in righteousness and holiness and truth, that sin does matter, that you do care about these things, but that also, on the same exact token, you do care so much about the world. Lord, I pray a blessing on this church as we go out into the mission field. Lord, that we would catch uh, uh, just a fresh renewal of what you've called us to, Lord. And uh, just as we, your people stood there at the mountain, 
uh, at the foot of the mountain those thousands and thousands of years ago. And even though we know that they failed, they cried out with one voice, you tell the Lord that we will do it. I pray that we as this church and your church in this nation would cry out as the Israelites did, whatever it takes, Lord, we will do it. We are on your side, God. Ultimately, we want to be yours. We want to be your people. Do a work in us and let us fulfill your mission and let us see your mission grow and expand into this world bigger and stronger and more amazing than ever before, Lord. We claim that today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you're dismissed. Thank you for coming. We'll see you next week as we lead into Easter. It's going to be some great time.